Hey guys, welcome to Watcher of Realms. This is a beginner's guide video. It is primarily going to be full of a lot of different tips and tricks to help you get through the game. And with that out of the way, let's get started. So I'm going to go over this in a number of different sections. There will be chapters along the timeline of this video, so feel free to skip to what interests you the most. And to start things off, we're going to talk about your account and some redemption codes, because people like free stuff. So there are four codes that I know of right now. They may expire at some point. I will put them up on the screen. They are WOR, for, you know, for Water of Realms. So WOR123, WOR777, WOR888, and WOR Launch713 for the 13th of July, the launch date that was announced. So those are the four redemption codes that I'm aware of. If anyone finds any others that do come up over the launch window, then do leave a comment and I'll update a pinned sticky. In order to redeem these codes, you click on your character profile on the top left, you go to settings and you hit the button at the bottom, redeem code, and you simply enter it in here. Once you've confirmed this code, you once you've confirmed these codes, you'll get it sent to your mailbox, which you can open by hitting this menu icon in the top right and going to mail. And this is where all the rewards will be sent. The next tip is if you go to your settings again, you can link your account up in the top right with account connection. I strongly suggest you do this as early as you can if you want to keep your account. Otherwise, it is very easy to lose your account should you lose your device for any reason. If you switch account out of it, a lot of different things can happen. Definitely link your account early on to avoid losing it. The next tip is if you were just starting and you were under level 35, bear in mind the codes I just mentioned before will level up your account quite fast to give you account XP. Under level 35, you can be invited by a friend as a, like a referee and it will grant you rewards. You can also refer free people as well. So if you go to this invite friends button on the left side of the screen, you can hit a button on the top right called use invite code. And if you hit the copy here, you can paste this to a friend or paste it in global chat or whatever it is and ideally get free people to join. And the first three people that use your referral code, once they hit these level account level milestones, will grant you rewards that will be sent to your mailbox. So it's definitely worth doing. And as there'll be a bunch of players joining and a bunch of people leveling very fast, I would definitely do this as soon as you join if you can, just because it's a bunch of rewards. It's pretty good to have. I think you'll get these quite early, the level 30 ones as well. And lastly, regarding some of just the general account stuff, if you go to this button on the left, it opens your friends tab, just this one here and you can hit quick claim and quick gift that will give you friendship points based on the number of friends you have that you have received and sent gifts to it's up to 40 times per day so you only need up to 40 friends out of 100 to get the full amount from it you can use these friendship points by hitting the plus button next to stamina at the top of the screen and then you can hit friendship points redemption section of this video which is combat we're going to talk about some general combat strategies and just general tips to help get you through if you're new to tower defense games my first tip would be whenever you go into a mission, have a quick look at this. When you select the mission, you can hit this magnifying glass and that will show you a bunch of map info about the stage. You can see the different enemies that appear in a stage and you can see the general map layout. These tiles are called platforms that you can place heroes on and these are the lanes that enemies will move through. You don't have to spend a massive amount of time checking this, but it can be really helpful if you get stuck on a stage. Primarily the things I look for are the resistances of the enemies so I know which kind of heroes to use. If they have low magic resistance then mages are very good. If they have low defense then marksmen and fighters are very good. That's a general rule of thumb. Another thing that's good to note when looking at these map infos, these flat circular disc portals like the circles on the ground, they always spawn ground enemies. They walk along through these paths. Whereas the circle in the middle, this portal here, will spawn airborne enemies that will fly through the map. You can't see the parving on this info screen, but it is very important to know if there are airborne enemies or not, otherwise you may not bring a marksman or a mage that can deal with them. In regards to what kind of heroes I bring on a mission, I tend to bring one or two healers, one or two defenders, but usually you can get away with one, especially when you're progressing, and the rest of it is just my strongest DPS. But as a rule of thumb, it's good to bring a marksman or two as well, not just rely on ground fighters. When it comes to placement strategy, one of the first things I do is look at where my healers can cover. If you go to place a platform hero or a fighter or a defender, you can see the green tiles where they can be placed. And if I go to place a fighter, I can only place them on these ground tiles. If I go to place a healer or a marksman or a mage, you can see I can use any of these green tiles on the platforms. So the first thing I tend to look at when I'm going to a new stage is where can my healers cover? And when you go to place them, you can then drag them to face your heroes. You can't change this after they've been placed. So for that reason, I like to use healers with a really nice, easy to use range, such as Vortex. And then you can place him down and face him up. And now all of the possible tiles are covered by his range. Clicking him again will show his range. So now I can place my fighter down and know that he's covered by a healer and won't die. I think that's a, generally a good tip 
when looking at where to place your heroes. Another good thing is to keep in mind where the enemies are parving. If you don't pay attention to where the enemies are spawning, you may get caught out like this. So try to pay attention to where they're coming from, and you can see that by the red arrows that zigzag across the map. For instance, at the start of this mission, you can see the line moved here first. That means that there's an enemy spawning here soon and will move. Also, sometimes enemies are stationary, and this timer will show you when they're about to begin moving on the map. So it's well worth paying attention to when these arrows come out and the timers above enemies' heads. My preference is to use fighters for a lot of content as they can block and prevent enemies from walking through. However, they are unable to attack flying enemies by default. There are some fighters that can attack airborne enemies, but not all of them are capable of doing that. If you find yourself in a situation where you're going to fail a mission or enemies are going to reach the portal, you can just hit the cog in the top right and go to restart and it doesn't cost you any stamina and allows you to instantly replay the mission. So definitely do this to save yourself time if things are going badly. Likewise, if a mission fails, the enemies get to the portal and you lose your lives as shown up here. The mission will fail, but it won't cost you any stamina, so you're free to try again. Heroes cost points to deploy. As you can see in the bottom right corner, I have 45 and it's ticking up pretty rapidly. And if you go to any of your heroes, the right side shows a number, which is their cost to deploy, which is 19 for iron. So if I place iron, you can see my cost points reduced to 28, ticking up again. However, if iron dies, I do not get any of the cost points back. So if you look here, he's at 37 cost now. He dies and it's still ticking up as normal. I didn't gain any back from his death. However, if I place him down now, I have 12. He costs 19, and if I remove him, you can see I get half of it back. So a good tip is if any of your heroes are about to die and there's nothing you can do about it, despawn them just before they die to get cost points back, as it can help quite a bit. Moving on to everyone's favourite area of any gacha game, summoning, which is unlocked after completing stage 9 of the first chapter. There are a few different types of summoning resources, the primary ones being... These rare summoning crystals and diamonds. Diamonds cost 88 per summon. There is no discount for 10 times summoning. There is also another summoning currency called a legendary summoning crystal, which is limited to only four and five star heroes. And there is a third summoning currency called an ancient summoning crystal. You get these incredibly infrequently and you get them mostly in the late game. The summoning event to actually use these is usually around once a month. So they are not easily used. They are not easily gained. And they are kind of akin to light and dark summons or void summons if you're familiar with other gacha games. They have an increased chance of granting legendary lords, but primarily their focus is to grant you access to a specific faction called the Chaos Dominion, which are more focused on arena. It's a new faction and there is expected to be a lot more of them coming in future updates. But generally, yeah, they're a more exclusive faction and you can also get different legendary lords for some of the other factions as well. So they are a very particular, very rare resource where you can get the fanciest heroes. So my main tips for general summoning. The first one is do not do the daily quest. This one here, summon one time. You should only be summoning on weekends during two times events, or I believe if you have a new account, there is a two times event on your account for the first few days. There are two primary types of summoning events. If you go to the calendar by hitting events up here, the first tab is event calendar, and you can see the events coming up for the week. On a summoning weekend, which spans from Friday to Sunday, there is either one of two events. The first one is a limited rate up. This increases the chance of a legendary hero for both the normal summons and the legendary summons and it basically just doubles it. So it goes from half a percent to 1%, and this is where you should be spending your summons. The other summoning event, which, which isn't available in this current week coming up, so I can't show you exactly how it looks, Basically, they will pick two to three legendary heroes that will have a 10 times greater chance of being summoned. But the super important thing to know about this is that it does not increase the base chance of getting a legendary hero. It just means that if you do get a legendary hero, it is vastly more likely to be one of those three heroes shown. So it can be good if you're more late game and you're angling for a really specific hero or if you're spending money on the game. But if you're a free to play player, you really, really want to be aiming for these two times events because you need to maximize the number of legendary heroes in your account. It also doubles the chance of getting epic heroes as well. So if you're a newer account, and especially if you're a free to play account, you want to be saving your summons for these events and definitely make the most of the two time summons you get as a beginner as well. Going to the summoning tab, you should likely see it. Do make sure you're selecting the right summoners. Sometimes there is an extra event going on. Just double check on the right side what event it is. If you want to see the details of your hero summons, you can click up here to see a breakdown of the rates. Legendary Lords and Epic Lords do have a much lower rate than normal heroes as they do have a much bigger impact, but we'll go over those later. If you want to see your pity count, unfortunately there is no pity timer in the game, but you can see your overall summon count by hitting this summon rewards button on the right side of your screen. There are many milestones throughout your summoning that will give you different rewards, so it's sometimes worth checking those to see what's coming up. If you are fortunate and summon an epic or a legendary hero, 
then once per day you will be prompted to share and you will gain 50 diamonds. You can do this and then click on Instagram or whatever application you have installed. You don't actually have to complete the share, you just have to do it one time per day and you will get the diamonds. So it's not bad, it's free 50 diamonds. So definitely consider doing this. In regards to what to actually do with your heroes, which ones to sell, which ones can you sell, can't you sell, the general rule of thumb is never sell any legendary heroes and only sell epic heroes if you've already awakened them five times. When you select a hero on the right side, you can see the number of awakenings just down here. So if you click on the awakening, you'll see the highlighted ones are the ones that have been awakened and the dark gray ones have not been awakened yet. You can also see this displayed as a count in Roman numerals on your character's icon. You can sell rare heroes that you don't need or aren't using by hitting this button here to sell. And then you can just click this button to select all of your unlocked rare heroes and you will be granted 30 diamonds per hero you sell. Before selling any heroes, it is worth keeping in mind there is a hero fusion system in the game. Currently, you can fuse one legendary abomination and you can fuse four different epic heroes, Lightlock, Fiowin, Livian, and Komodo. Most of these heroes are actually pretty good, with the best, of course, being Abomination, a really good legendary, Livian being a pretty good defender, not the best, but quite usable, and Fiowin being a very useful marksman that can help you in a lot of the game's content. Lightlock is a decent healer, but not one of the greatest, but he is definitely usable and can help you progress. Komodo is quite niche, however, he is also a fusion material for Abomination. So in regards to which heroes you can sell, have a look through this list, and keep in mind that some of the heroes you start with such as Camille and Rex are fusion materials, Bora as well. So it's a good idea to take these heroes to four star max level and max promotion because then you can use them for fusion in future. Don't sell any fusion heroes if you haven't fused the heroes already. Though since we've already touched on the topic, we'll move on to heroes now. At the time of making this video, there were 158 heroes in the game and the majority of them are legendary heroes at this point. Not many epic or rare heroes are added to the game. And you do start with a number of rare heroes that are fairly useful in the early game. Rex is kind of an important story character they give you and he is a decent defender. He can actually be used to reasonable effect, but again, I would not advise taking him beyond four star. Camille is similar. You can use her for fusion as well. And again, she is a decent early game healer to use. So she is worth using up to four star as well. And finally, Voltus is given to you right at the start. He is a good AoE mage that you can use to help progress in the very early game. Generally, as a rule of thumb, I would advise against focusing on rare heroes. This game is very stat heavy and they don't have as high base stats as other heroes, but it's good to keep in mind that rares just won't scale that well late game. So I would advise trying to build around the epics and legendaries you do pull first. When talking about heroes, one of the most important things to know is the faction system and the Lord system. In the gallery here, you can click on the different factions on the left to see which heroes belong to which faction. There are some heroes that belong to multiple factions, and what that means is they can gain the benefits from both factions if they're in that team. So you may be wondering, what are those benefits for that faction and how do you activate it? Well, if you look at these heroes here, there are unique icons on the first three heroes. There's a little crown on top of them. What this crown means is they are a lord. They are a lord for this faction, and there are usually, but not always, a lord for each rarity. So there is a rare one, an epic one, and a legendary one. Though they have started to add extra legendary lords to the factions that already had one. But there are basically three tiers of lord. First, there is the rare lord, which increases his faction ally's basic attributes by 5%. All faction lords will grant bonus stats to their faction, 5% for a rare, 10% for an epic, and 15% for a legendary lord. There are more effects that come afterwards, and these are unique per faction, and they scale based on the rarity of the lord. So Nero, the rare lord for the curse faction, grants 15% bonus damage to faction allies when they are dealing damage to enemies that are under crowd control effects such as stun, freeze, immobilize, etc. Whereas the epic Aeon grants 20% damage, and the legendary Morrigan grants 30% damage, as well as an additional effect of a bonus 25% area of effect damage to her allies. In order to activate these faction lore benefits, you need to have them in your team, though you do not need to place them, and oftentimes you don't need to build them. So I would recommend keeping hold of any of the rare lords until you get a better version, the epic or the legendary versions of them. I can select her to join part of my team, and then you can see this icon is the curse faction. If I select other heroes with the same icon, you can see everyone is glowing. Whereas if I take an infernal hero and put them here, you can see that her faction icon is not lit up, it's not highlighted. So I can keep adding heroes from that faction to her team, and you can see that they're not getting any bonuses right now, it's not lit up. However, this character here is Pyros and he has a crown, he is a epic lord for the infernal faction, and when I select him you can see it lights up and activates this team, the bar becomes purple as he is a epic lord. And you can see when you use a legendary lord such as King Haas for the north faction, the bar becomes gold. 
So one thing to keep in mind with how this functions, I can fill an entire team with cursed heroes, but then when I place them on the second team down here, these ones are not getting the bonus from this team. You can only get the bonus on one of your teams from one Lord. And if you do happen to have two Lords from the same faction, you cannot fill two teams using both Lords as well. So that's just another little tidbit to be aware of. The final thing to know about Lords is when you've unlocked the full 10 slots of your team, so you have 10 placements available, you can only actually place eight of them, which means you have two slots available to use in however you want that you don't necessarily have to place because you can only have eight heroes placed at any given time. If they die or you remove them, you can replace them with the other heroes, but it is a really good way to use those two excess slots by using lords that you have no intention of placing. For example, this is Gear Raid 3. Gear Raid 3 is an airborne content and you need airborne damage dealers to kill the waves. King Haas is a defender. He has no real purpose in this raid. However, he does grant me the ability to give bonus stats to my heroes for characters who are actually a much better fit for this content. So you can see I've placed down Maul here and I have seven more deployments left in the bottom right. Deployable seven. That means two are not going to be able to be placed. I don't really want to place the lords I have here, King Haas and Pyros, but that's fine because they're still granting faction bonuses to my allies even though I'm not deploying them. So let's move on to more generally what the hero classes are and the different damage types. When you go to the hero screen, you can see down here next to your hero level, there's a little icon. It's like a little dagger. If it's a fighter, it's a bow for a marksman. It's two hands for a healer, etc. And if you click on this, you will see a breakdown of the different classes in the game. This can be important. Some content is specific to certain heroes. They do generally infer different things. Fighters have the highest base attack in the game and they can physically block two enemies. That means two enemies will run into them and they will stop two enemies. Defenders typically have the highest defense and HP and they can block three enemies at a time, although they don't do much damage. Their focus is on holding enemies in place for your DPS to kill them and usually providing utility functions and defensive abilities to help the rest of your team stay alive. Marksmen are typically longer range damage dealers. Often their basic attacks will state that they prioritize airborne units and sometimes they even have bonus effects that deal more damage to airborne units. Healers are the supporters that keep your team alive, mainly your defenders and fighters, though there are enemies that will attack the rest of your team as well, such as ranged enemies and flying enemies, and there are sometimes passive effects on the map that will hurt your team, so healers are very important. There are two primary ways that healers scale, either they scale on attack, someone like Elowen you can see if you click on the skills and go to the first ability here, grants attack based healing, this means that it scales on her attack stat, and all heals scale a little bit on the targets, the recipients, max HP, which is kind of a strange calculation, but generally what you need to know is you can see what their main primary stat scale is. So attack for Elowin, or for someone like Vortex, it is HP based, so it's Vortex's max HP. Besides how healers scale, there are a few different types of healers. For example, Elowin heals three targets in range. Vortex only heals one target in range. There are more multi-healers such as Midan who heals three targets in range. There are other healers such as Dolores, who heals all allies in range and Aylin as well who heals all allies in range and Sadie there are a bunch but basically there are three primary types of heals there is single target heals there are free target heals and then there is everyone in range it is important to check out what the healer's actual range is you can do this by going to attributes details and then you'll see it up here so Elowin heals the row behind her as two rows forward and on the side as well whereas Vortex has a really nice wide long range. So although he can only heal one target at a time, it is a much broader range. You do tend to notice that the heroes that heal only one person have slightly better range usually. And the healers that heal three at a time can tend to heal behind them, which, which makes them a bit easier to place as well. And the healers that heal everyone around them have more of a star shaped heal that covers all the adjacent tiles to them. So that covers how the healers work. And last up we have mages. So mages are your magic damage heroes and we'll go over the damage types in a second. They tend to be focused on either single target damage or AOE damage. A hero like Nocturne focuses on high single target damage, whereas someone like Iona focuses on dealing AoE damage. So I mentioned it briefly earlier, but there are different damage types in the game. If you go to a character and go to the skills tab, you can see up here damage type magic for this hero Hex. And if you click on it, it will show you there is either piercing, magic or normal. Normal damage does not lose damage to any target, but it doesn't gain damage. Whereas piercing damage deals bonus 20% to light armor and magic deals bonus 20% to heavy armor. If you're unsure how to see which enemies are what, when you go to any kind of mission in the campaign or otherwise, when you go to the magnifying glass, the map info, and you select one of the enemies, you can see in the tags just underneath the enemy's name and icon, common armor, 
heavy armor or light armor. So that is well worth paying attention to when choosing which heroes to use in the missions. If you see a mission full of light armor enemies, you'll be gaining 20% damage using piercing damage units. And the vast majority of piercing damage units are marksmen. The vast majority of magic damage units are mages. You do get heroes that kind of go in between, such as Hex, who does magic damage, but broadly speaking, it tends to work that way. In terms of progressing your heroes, there are a number of different ways to make them stronger, pretty much covered by all these tabs on the right side here. The first is leveling up your heroes, which you can do by gaining experience in fighting, just generally playing, using them will grant them a small amount of experience. But the most efficient way to level up a hero is this upgrade button here and then just clicking upgrade and consuming some of your experience potions. The best way to get them is from the experience raid which you'll unlock later on. So this is going to be granting major stat boosts to the hero but the second way you can increase the stats of a hero and sometimes gain new effects is promotions. So promoting a hero turns some of the gold stars purple. You can do this using these insignias which you can get through the insignia raids which we'll talk about later. Generally speaking promotions are incredibly important and grant you a massive amount of stat bonuses so it is really important that you focus on promoting your core heroes, unlocking new passives, new talents and increasing their stats by a lot. You can also check what the promotions do by checking these roman numeral buttons on the left as well. Next up is gear which you can gain by doing the gear raids as well as generally playing in the campaign and progressing. There's a lot to get into with gear but we'll go over that in the next section. Next up there are skills so you can level up the skills on a hero. You can do this usually by using dust initially which is a very easy to get resource. But once your heroes have reached a certain amount of skill ups it moves over to using skill crystals which are a much harder resource to come by. So be a bit more deliberate with how you use these resources. Try to focus them on your most important heroes as they are slightly more restricted. When you click on a hero's skills you can see what the upgrades do it is random so bear that in mind when you hit this button it will be random which skill gets upgraded and unfortunately usually it tends to avoid the ultimate which is quite important for most characters next up there are awakenings which we touched on a little bit earlier this is basically feeding a duplicate hero to itself so when you click on it here and you hit this plus button you can feed a dupe to a hero in order to awaken it and unlock the next tier of the awakening rewards you can also feed different materials to awaken heroes such as Epic Sage Soulstone here or this is a Wrath specific Soulstone you get from I believe the Day 60 login. There are 5 awakenings max per hero and you can look at all of them here. Usually the 1st, 3rd and 5th are the massive upgrades, the 2nd and 4th tend to be stats and just general percentage increases. And finally there are artifacts you can put on heroes. These are pretty good, but it's hard to get them early game. You can get some really basic ones early game. You can forge them with materials you can get from raids, but you kind of want to avoid spending resources in, on these until at least legendary items. You want to avoid upgrading these until you get to legendary artifacts, but really you mainly want to focus on myth artifacts when you do get to them. And they do give you a massive amount of stats as well. So they are very powerful and very beneficial. It's just the stat difference between like a high level myth piece you see here is 1500 attack and 4600 HP versus a max legendary piece, only 600 attack, 1900 HP. You're better off waiting as much as you can, but legendary ones are still decent. It's just the epic ones are really low and not that beneficial. So that covers the heroes. Now let's quickly talk about gear just briefly. The left side of your gear is a weapon and armor piece slot. So weapon and armor and the right side are accessories. This is a bangle, a necklace and a ring. These are two separate sets that drop from different parts of the game. If I equip two pieces from the same set on this character, he will gain a stat bonus, which is highlighted here. And it's 25% attack for this particular set. Whereas on the right side, there are a bunch of other sets and you need to match all three to get the set bonus. The left side, the weapon and the armor have fixed main stats. The weapon will always be flat attack. The chest piece will always be flat HP. The right side can be pretty much any stat in the game, bar a few, and they do have specific slots as well. So crit rate tends to be only available on bangles. Attack speed tends to only be available on necklaces. And rage regen tends to only be available, again, all of these as a main stat on rings. However, these are the most important pieces as they can have much more powerful main stats on them. As a general rule of thumb, blue and purple so rare and epic gear is better off as a flat main stat which is usually not the case in most of these games you want to have percentages all the way the reason for this is that you're capped on how far you can level up gear and epic and rare gear can only be upgraded to plus four and plus eight which is not very far when it goes up to 16 when you get to the mythic red gear at the end that means that the main stat does not get very far in rare and epic gear 
and the substat rolls will actually they're the same they can roll just as high on a myth piece as they could on a rare or an epic piece and thus you'll actually have a higher roll on a rare or an epic piece additionally if you're early game your heroes won't be very high in their base stats so yeah as a general rule of thumb i would advise using flat main stats when you have rare and epic gear when you move into yellow legendary or red for mythic gear it's better to move over to percentage gear in terms of what stats to focus on for a dps you want to be using as much attack bonus as you can get you do want to build up crit rate. Crit rate is really beneficial, but it is much harder to hit the necessary milestones to make crit rate shine. So my suggestion is to prioritize attack bonus and aim for 100 or 90% plus crit rate before you start taking crit damage as a main stat. But while you're progressing and while you're early game, I would suggest attack bonus and maybe one crit rate main piece on your gear. As for substats, it's as a DPS, generally split between attack bonus, crit rate, and crit damage. When you are gearing a healer, your main focus is going to be whatever their primary healing stat is. So if I take Lili, for example, she scales on attack-based healing. So were I to gear her, I would focus on attack main stats. And the second priority for a healer would be the healing effect stat. So you can see this is an attack piece here. It's a set that grants healing, so this is pretty good. And there is a piece here which grants healing effect. So these both scale into the healing of Lili. I believe their primary stat does scale a bit better than healing effect, but it is a good idea to balance them. So if you have a healing piece using attack bonus as the main that ideally it has healing effect as the second as one of the secondary stats and if you have a healing effect piece ideally it has attack bonus or hp bonus as one of the secondary stats so that's generally how you gear a healer picking up rage regen to make their ultimate come up faster is a good idea as well i haven't really gone over that so very quickly all heroes have an ultimate it can either be auto or it can be manual if it's auto it will just fire it whenever it's ready if it is manual you will have to choose to activate the ultimate this number here with the lightning strike and the flame, this is the rage cap. This is how much rage is required to be able to cast this ultimate or for it to automatically cast. And the one on the right with the, the green play button on it, that is the starting rage. That is how much rage this hero gets when they're deployed. So that some of them have really high rage at the start and it makes it really easy to ult the first time. So yeah, back to the gearing for healers. Focus on their primary stat, pick up healing effect as a secondary. Make them a little bit durable if you can because it helps. So HP scaling healers I quite like because they're very easy to gear. And other than that, picking up some attack speed to make heals come out faster is nice. And pick up some rage regen to bring their ultimates up faster as well. When gearing a defender, it's really quite simple. They just need to be survivable. They're never really going to do much damage other than very, very specific legendary heroes. But in general, almost all defenders do practically no damage. So you just want to chuck as much HP on them as possible. And try to pick up some defense if you can. I tend to just take triple hp bonus as the main stat but it's fine to take defense bonus as well that pretty much covers how i gear heroes in early game it doesn't matter too much the quick equip system is not great but it might be fine if you're very early game and you don't want to get into it too much gear sets don't matter that much especially when you're early but even towards late game the stats matter significantly more a lot of the bonuses you get from gear in this game are just going to be flat stat padding like 10 percent hp 20 healing effect Having a better rolled gear will outshine this really easily. So focus on getting good gear and good rolls on the substats over going for sets. And a final thing to say regarding gear, the way to farm it when you want to get more gear is in the raids here in the gear raid section and you unlock the first gear raid at chapter four stage six i believe gear raid one and you unlock the next two gear raid two and gear raid three on chapter five i believe stage 15. this is where you can farm gear gear raid one will drop the left side of the gear so the weapon and the armor pieces and if you go to the stages here the different colors you can see what gear it drops on the right side so this is rare and epic gear from stage 10 onwards it becomes epic and legendary gear from 13 onwards it becomes legendary and mythic gear and from 18 onwards it becomes just mythic gear my advice would be try to not spend too much time and stamina farming for gear until you get to around stage 10 do your best to progress to this point without dumping too much stamina into farming farming for epic and rare gear at stage 9 and lower is not really ideal Best case scenario, wait until stage 13 to start farming so that you can get more mythic gear drops, but that's not always going to be doable, especially if you're free to play, you won't have the heroes to do that. But again, try to hold off as long as you can burning stamina farming and try to progress throughout the rest of the game as much as you can before committing to farming in some of the earlier stages to progress. So let's talk a bit about the campaign and an important quest line called the storyline. 
Unfortunately, I can't show you the storyline because once you complete it, it is gone. So I don't have the button, but it would be down here. You unlock the storyline after completing chapter two, mission seven. So chapter two, stage seven. And it basically gives you a whole quest series. And at the very end, when you finish the entire quest series, you unlock a legendary hero. That legendary hero is the Nightmare Council's Volker. Volka is a pretty cool fighter. She hits three heroes at a time. She does a bunch of good stuff. She has some really interesting benefits to her. So she is well worth focusing on unlocking. And generally the rewards throughout the questline are very good as well. The main thing to know about the storyline is that sometimes the quests will gate you. You know, complete guild boss or do X amount of arena matches or something like that. And if you spent your guild boss already, then you're unable to progress in your storyline until the next day. So you may block yourself accidentally. So it is strongly advised you complete your storyline quests first whenever you go to play before doing anything else as you don't want to accidentally block yourself from progressing for that day. I do have a website that I maintain and keep little notes and tier lists and guides and stuff on, mabucket.com. I'll put a link on the screen and I'll share a quick image. I have a table showing you all of the quests in the storyline. This does get outdated fairly quickly as they do change things. I will be playing on global as well, so I'll be updating the table to keep it as fresh and up to date as possible. So check the table on my website to keep an eye on what's coming up in the storyline. It, it does help quite a bit to know what resources you may need to save and not spend in advance. So moving on to the campaign, there are a number of chapters per, there are a number of stages per chapter. Each chapter tends to have like a mechanical focus. The first chapter is a tutorial. The second chapter is pretty much a tutorial as well, though you start getting introduced to more mechanics. And as you go through the rest of the chapters, they do unlock more difficult and interesting mechanics. The main thing to keep in mind with the campaign is there are three difficulties, normal, hard and expert. It is well worth progressing in them as you unlock them, as you do get a whole load of rewards from campaign. It's probably the most important thing when you're starting out. And the best thing to keep in mind with any of these chapters is there are chapter rewards at the top here. So if you click this icon, you get progress rewards. But each mission, when you complete it, you can get two stars for completing the mission and you get the third star if you don't let a single enemy through. So it's three stars per stage in each of the chapters. And once you get them all, you get all of these rewards. So diamonds or psychic powers or gold or stamina or whatever, what have you. But they are pretty good towards the end. You can get some pretty good stuff. There are also some pretty good rewards for clearing these chapter stages as well. Sometimes they'll give you a massive amount of XP potions or they'll give you summons. So it's, it's very important to progress your chapters as much as possible, as well as unlocking new features for the game. A tip for progressing in the campaign, if you get stuck on a mission and it's especially hard, some missions will let you use an assist unit. So you see here there's a plus button assist unit. If you click on it, you can take friends heroes or sometimes it's just a random hero selected by the system and you can bring them into your team to use them which can help out quite a lot. One thing to bear in mind these heroes are not counted as part of either team and they can't gain lord benefits but still I would suggest using these as much as you can there is no real loss. The only downside to using these heroes is that if you clear a stage using an assist hero you are unable to then auto that stage in future because you don't have the hero. That doesn't matter for the campaign because you're never going to come back and auto these anyway. That being said, there are some stages such as some of the boss stages where the assist unit is locked and you're unable to clear it using assist heroes. But it seems to be only particular missions. So the final boss of chapter eight, for example, you can use an assist hero for this stage. So just check and my advice would be use assist heroes wherever you can. If it helps speed it up, why not? So one of the most important resources in the game, or probably the most important resource in the game, is stamina. It is this lightning strike at the top of the screen here. You restore it passively over time, and you can restore it using a number of different means. Hitting this plus, you can see there are three types of potions, and there is this friendship redemption system. Another way is if you go to the shop, and you go to the diamond shop, you can buy it with 60 diamonds, will get you 200 stamina. These are stamina potions that you can consume whenever you want to. So it's, it's not too bad. 60 diamonds is quite expensive. You can buy these at a discount in the Dwarven Association sometimes, but we'll get into that later. Generally, when if you want to know how best to spend your stamina, the absolute first priority is progressing your campaign. You, you want to get through this as fast as possible and you want to backtrack and complete missions at free start if you are unable to clear them before and you've got a bit stronger. After that, your choice on how you want to spend stamina is in the raids pretty much. Either you're going to spend it farming promotion raids to promote your heroes and gain more stats and unlock some of their passives in the resource raids to get experience potions or gold or in the gear raid to collect new gear pieces for your characters or later on in the artifact material raid which unlocks all the way at the end of chapter six to get artifacts for your heroes generally speaking if you're early game i think the first two are quite good ways to spend your stamina once you've got stuck on campaign 
Progressing your hero's levels and promotions is a really good way to get some extra stats. I would advise against spending too much time in the gear raid as I said earlier. Another thing to know with the resource raids, you unlock these by completing the campaign. You find them at milestones. The experience raids can be found on every single chapter. If you go around halfway through the chapter you'll see there's an experience dungeon around, around stage 7. Sometimes earlier you'll see these experience dungeons. It's the same map every time. It's the same thing. It's just they're a bit stronger. It costs a bit more stamina usually. And it gives you a lot more experience each time. So if you're going to farm for experience potions. Then you do want to progress as much as you can in your normal campaign. To get the highest stage to farm as possible. If you want to farm gold. You unlock that in the hard campaign. As you can see the hard campaign has these gold dungeons. And this is basically how you unlock the gold dungeons. You just have to get through the hard campaign to get through to unlock the higher stages of that one. You won't really need to farm gold for quite a while. You get a lot early game so that shouldn't be a problem. You'll mainly need to farm some XP dungeons. And one thing to keep in mind when farming XP dungeons is there are boosters for this. In the top left you can see here there's an XP boost. And I don't have it activated. There is no boost but when you do have it it doubles the amount of potions you get. So if you want to obtain it you can go to the shop and it will cost 150 diamonds which is kind of steep. But also in the Dwarven Association, you, you can buy it in the Awakening Shop with these coins, the Epic Awakening tokens. You get 100 per Epic Hero you scrap. If you're early game, you shouldn't be scrapping any Epic Heroes. So you would need to buy it with Diamonds. It's not super advisable to spend 150 Diamonds, but if you're going to blow through a good chunk of stamina, like a 1,000 stamina or more, it could well be worth it to stockpile as much experience potions as you can. But again, you really want to be doing that once you're able to do some of the higher stages of the XP dungeon. There are only 8 stages. The 8th one gives you 20,000 stamina once you've managed to kill all of the enemies. It's, it varies based on how many enemies you manage to kill. It's quite easy. And for example, stage 4 is only 3.2 thousand. Stage 7 is 10.5 thousand. You see there's a big gain per stage you can do. Around stage 5 to 6 is probably a good point to farm stamina. I would advise waiting for stage you know 6 or 7. Stage 8 is pretty hard to unlock. It's part of the new chapter that came out. No one's going to be farming that for quite a while on the new server. So don't worry about stage 8. Ideally wait till stage 6 or 7 to farm if you can. It just depends how quickly we're able to progress. Another thing to know is there are a bunch of events in the game. There's Oracle's Trials and there are events. So these are the events here. At the moment I have Brave Conquest and I have Tales of the Smith that will start tomorrow. And these are basically things you can complete by doing the relevant content. So for Brave Conquest, I need to get gear or meteorites. So this is from the gear raids or from the artifact material raids. For these events in general, I think it's a pretty good idea to try to follow spending stamina along with these events. Bear in mind that you get points to the events based on what you can attain. So if you're very early game, you're only going to be getting the rare epics sort of stuff, the gear drops and the meteorites. And you're not going to get through these events. It's going to be really hard for you to progress through the events and you'll be wasting your stamina. So in the first few days, maybe the first week of the game, I wouldn't worry about these much at all. It's just going to be too expensive for you to compete really. The other side are the Oracle's Trials. These are coming up throughout the week. On I think there is a cycle to them. There are a whole bunch. They have them for specific raids. So Gear Raid 2 here, Gear Raid 3 there. This one is for summoning arrival of heroes. And this is a leaderboard. This is competing with other heroes on the server. Based on how many heroes you summon or how many dungeons you farm of a given piece of content. Gives you a point score. And that score gives you a standing at the end of this event. They tend to last I think about 4 days. And you get rewards if you poll in the top 10. But the main rewards are in the top 3. My advice would be don't go too heavy on these oracles trials. Wait a day, maybe two days to see how competitive your group is. If you see there's a couple of whales or really active players who are miles ahead on points at the start, it's not worth competing. It's only really worth competing in the Oracle's Trials if you think you can place in the top three. So I tend to give it a couple of days before deciding if I want to give it a try. Since we've been going over these a little bit, let's talk a tiny bit more in detail about some of the raids. So first off, the gear raids. There are three of them. The first one drops the left slot, so the weapon and armor. Gear Raid 2 and Gear Raid 3 drop the accessories. But you can see all these icons here. These are all the different gear sets in the game. They are unique per gear raid that you farm. So all of these gear sets here drop from Gear Raid 2, etc. And you can see there's a slight difference in coloring. So the Tempest and the Rapidity sets are kind of like a bluey background. Whereas Guardian, Fatalities, Curse... 
Glacier, etc. These are all purple, and these sets at the end are Gold, Ancient Wrath, and Invigoration. Each of these gear rates have their own different sets, and these are attainable by different parts of the stages. You can see which sets drop in which stage by looking at the bottom of the screen. Drops random gear of these sets. Up to stage 9 will get you the first two sets, Rapidity and Tempest, and then from stage 10, it upgrades to these new sets, the purple sets we saw. And these purple sets are included all the way to the end, so stage 21, you can see they're still dropping. However, stage 18 just adds more of the purple sets. It's stage 19 to 21 that add these gold sets to it. 19 to 21 are incredibly hard stages that will take quite a while to beat. Up to 18 is kind of in the same band, but 19 to 21 were added later and they are pretty much end game content. These are really hard to beat. So a quick overview of how each of these works. Gear Raid 1 is like AoE damage content, you want mages for this or big AoE nuke heroes and you want supporting healers. There are some really good healers that provide attack boosts or rage regen, stuff to help your mages shine, they're really important for this. Fighters and defenders and most marksmen are not particularly good in Gear Raid 1. Gear Raid 2 is a very defensive raid, you need a lot of defenders, you need a lot of healers. Fighters can do pretty good, mages and marksmen do have a place but they will die very easily. So your main priority is going to be having good defenders and good healers for this content. I think Gear Raid 2 is actually the easiest because you can get by by doing some pretty clever strategies. Gear Raid 3 is an anti-air raid. So defenders and fighters have basically no place in this raid. There are a few very good fighters that actually can target airborne units, but they are the exception. Generally, you want to be using marksmen for this content as well as a few mages. You will need one or two healers to keep your team alive as well. But that's generally how these raids work and they are the main progression in Watcher of Realms. You're going to be building teams for each of these pieces of content. Your AoE team, your kind of defensive tanky team and healers and then your anti-air team here. As for the other raids, the promotion raid we talked about a bit earlier, this is how you promote your heroes. There's a bunch of materials here that go up in the different stages of the, the promotion tiers. The final three promotion tiers use this level three one. The first one or two uses the rare insignia marksman one or fighter or mage one. And in the middle, you have to use the epic ones. Eventually you start needing the legendary and myth extracts as well, which are kind of annoying to farm, but not too bad. Each of these raids are kind of tailored towards the type of heroes you need for the content. The mage content has a lot of heavy armor units so you do want magic damage. The endurance content deals passive damage to you so you need to have healers keeping everyone alive and having defenders and fighters block the lanes to prevent enemies getting through. The melee attack one has no platforms, you have to just have fighters down to block enemies and they get a bit of self healing granted to them as well. They're all kind of focused on different things, the marksman one is just airborne enemies so you can't really use defenders or fighters. So yeah, they're, they're all pretty simple, they're all pretty easy, it's not too hard content, it's just to get the promotion materials. There is the artifact material raid which we kind of talked about a bit earlier, this is pretty much just fighter content. You do need one defender and one healer. The earlier stages you are able to place down more heroes, it's just if you look at the late stages, there's only a single platform. That's usually where your healer is going, you're going to have a defender here, and then the rest of it's just going to be a load of fighters. But if you go to some of the earlier stages there will be two platforms and the very early stages will have more platforms to help you out until your team gets stronger and you get more fighters. At this point you can use one healer and one ranged DPS, or if you are able to, you can just use two DPS and nuke the boss down really quick. This mission ends as soon as you kill the boss Salazar. There are a few other ones here that I haven't talked about at all yet. Faction, Trial, Guild Boss and Tide. We'll go over Guild Boss as the next big category, but to quickly talk about Faction, Trial and Tide. Tide is a piece of content that you unlock after completing Chapter 4, Stage 1. And this is like a horde mode where you fight through waves of enemies. You can go here to the rewards, little magnifying glass, and you can see all the rewards that you unlock for clearing each stage. Right now there are 140 stages and you can get some pretty good materials from here, but it's very hard content to do because it's entirely based on the battle power of your team. It's kind of just an arbitrary value that was somehow created in the game that determines how strong your team is. You can place quite a lot of heroes and you withstand the waves, you fight through them, you can clear up to three waves a day and then you can allow it to auto progress. So this is mine at the moment, I'm on stage 129, but generally speaking the main priority here is just to have as much BP as you can, and I would suggest using AoE mages as they tend to shine really well here. So with that out of the way, now let's move to the next big section which is guilds. Guilds are unlocked after completing chapter 3 stage 6. At that point you can either create or join a guild. The main things to know about guilds in this game is there's a guild level you can see here and there's a guild boss. They are going to be adding guild wars pretty soon. I don't know exactly when that is but I think it's imminent. I don't have any details to go over about that in this video but for what we do have there are guild levels which will 
affect what you can buy from the guild shop and you have the guild boss which is kind of a thing you can do every day you have two attacks per day besides that guilds can have up to 30 players you get guild quests every day which you should be doing these every day as they grant xp for your guild the guild activity points doing that per week will grant you a lot of guild coins which you use in the guild shop and will level up your guild to grant you more stuff in the guild shop so the main thing you're going to be doing is of course the guild boss which is a dragon there are a bunch of difficulty scaling from easy all the way to nightmare 4 with more likely on the way when you attack the boss you deal damage to this bar here this percentage and once you get the boss to zero percent your entire guild anyone who attacks the boss from that point on or has attacked the boss to get it to zero percent will gain double rewards at daily reset so when the day resets you get a bunch of rewards from the boss which are determined by the amount of blood you do so for example if you manage to do a 2.1k blood to this nightmare 2 dragon then you can get some of these rewards you'll get two of the following items at random and if you do get the boss to zero percent it won't just be two of these you'll get two chests too so you'll have four rewards from this dragon because your boss managed to beat it to zero percent you can still attack a boss at zero percent guild boss is mostly focused on single target damage you want to have high damage hitters when actually playing the guild boss it will keep whatever your team is you used the last day you can override the autos as well and the amount of damage you do generates this blood counter up here you can't see it because it's ticking over really fast and every now and then you'll see this the boss throws up a big shield and it's casting a destructive spit you need to break the shield as quick as you can if you don't break the shield before the destructive spit is finished casting he will most likely kill your entire team so you see all these blue bars here these are my available ultimates on my heroes i will attempt to synergize them at the right time to break the shield so that i can ensure the boss doesn't kill me your goal is to last all the way until this rampage starts when the rampage starts the boss instead just flies off and leaves so you basically have four minutes to dps the boss to build as much blood as you possibly can and that's it that's where the boss flies off you get your score at the end giving you however much blood damage you did to the boss and you can see the count and try and improve your score for the next day the way i tend to use my attacks you get two per day i use my first attack on the boss that i know i can beat at 100 percent, so i can get the final reward tier so if you're just starting wait until the end of the day before making your attack so that your account gets as strong as possible aim for 200 blood on the first boss and if you're able to get 200 blood then attack the next boss ideally attack the bosses that your guild can beat so as a guild you want to try to come together to get the boss down to zero percent on whatever dragon you choose to attack but yeah i tend to save one attack for the one i have down so you know i can get max reward from it and then the next attack is my progressing attack so i'll attack the next difficulty and try to work myself up to max reward and once i have got it at max reward in one attack then the next day i'll move over and i'll start trying to progress on the next dragon that way you can keep trying to build your strategy improve your timings and all those good things so next up we'll talk about the shop in the game the dwarven association as well as the options if you do wish to spend any money so first off the dwarven association this is the in-game shop this is not a cash shop this is just the in-game currencies that you unlock by playing the game there are four tabs black market guild shop arena shop and awakening shop i have a whole video going over all of this and it's quite long so i don't want to go too detailed on this but as a general rule of thumb the black market has two key resources to buy stuff with diamonds and gold when it comes to diamonds you only really want to be buying these rare summoning shards here because they're discounted so rather than spending 88 diamonds to summon it will cost you 70 and you want to be buying the huge stamina potions at a discount or even just flat stamina if you want to with gold i like to buy stamina potions if they are available for gold and i buy legendary and myth extract with gold i'll also buy quite a lot of insignias with gold as it saves me stamina farming and sometimes I'll buy these fodder heroes so that I can star up heroes to use them to promote heroes. When you complete chapter 5 stage 7 you unlock this quick star up and it allows you to like really rapidly star up heroes. So this is a one star hero. Him plus another one star 500 gold and 1800 XP potions and I can click a button and it will turn him into a two star hero. And you can check this for a bunch of heroes and get them all done at once. So sometimes if you need to get enough fodder to promote a five star to a six star this is a really nice and easy way to do it but you might not have all the fodders so sometimes it's a good idea to buy the fodder heroes the ones and two stars from the dwarven association with gold but i wouldn't do this too much it's just a good thing to keep in mind if you are running low when it comes to actually spending money in the game there is a shop button in the bottom left i would not recommend the growth fund or most of these packs to be honest however the monthly card does give you 40 summons in total for whatever your local currency is around 10 pounds for me and that's not the worst ratio it's four summons per pound which is not bad 
There's also the privilege card bonus, which does have a discount for the first purchase you make. So it becomes just under five pounds for me. And this will unlock extra gear drops, bonus XP, bonus max stamina, bonus gold, more auto attacks. So I know people buy this a reasonable amount as well. My general recommendation is you may see there is a Iona pack. So just to show you again, this is the hero I'm on about, Iona. If you see that pack and you're okay with spending a little bit of money, I think it costs around five, six pounds. So, you know, whatever that is in dollars or euros, I would recommend that. I think that's probably the best value you can get. Iona is a mage, an AoE mage, and she's really good in a lot of content. Not just early game, even all the way to the end game. She's actually a really good AoE mage. So yeah, if you're considering spending money, my recommendation would be the Iona pack first, and then perhaps the card bonus pack and perhaps the privilege pass. Anyway, a very, very long video, so hopefully it was helpful to you guys. I do have a website, as I said, that has a bunch of guides and information, so hopefully that will be of use to you as well. And if you do find these videos interesting and useful, then I would appreciate it if you could subscribe and like the video to hopefully bring it to the attention of more people joining or looking to join Water of Realms. Anyway, that's it for this video. Thank you guys very much. Have a lovely time. Enjoy the game. Take care and bye-bye.